Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We are continuing our study in 2 Timothy, and we are concluding our study this morning. We're going to look at the last verses, verses 16 through 22, 2 Timothy 4. Some of you are wondering, so what are we going to do next week? And what we're going to do is begin a series of studies in Jeremiah. I say a series of studies. I'm not going to go through it each chapter. It's 52 chapters long, and I've done that before, but not on a Sunday morning. But I'm going to take some select passages and uh, go through that, about 11 perhaps lessons in the book of Jeremiah. But we'll begin with chapter 1 next week. But this week, we're finishing 2 Timothy, beginning with verse 16 of chapter 4. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, Trophimus, I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, also Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time in it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. In the last days of his life, John Wesley, who had been an indefatigable worker for the Lord, was unable to do a lot. He was unable to write, for example. And so he asked his housekeeper, Miss Ritchie, to write a note. When she asked him what she wanted him to write, he said, nothing but the best of all, God is with us. Some of the last words of John Wesley. That is the best of all. When life is ending, when friends have left, when we're alone, God is with us. That's what Paul learned in a difficult time and what he wrote in the final words of his last letter. Thoughts of past difficulties caused Paul's mind to turn to his trial in Rome and his first defense. He says in verse 16 that at my first defense, no one supported me. That's not a reference to Paul's original trial after his first imprisonment in Rome on which the book of Acts ends. Timothy would have known all of the details about that. This is new information on recent events following Paul's second arrest and imprisonment in Rome. His reference to his first defense has to do with the initial inquiry or preliminary investigation that preceded a formal trial. In Roman law, the the process was called a first action. It's been likened to a grand jury hearing in which a defendant would appear before the emperor or judge and his case would be evaluated. It was customary in that procedure for the accused to have a lawyer and witnesses in his defense as well as friends who who could appear in order to give moral support. But for some unexplained reason, Paul had none. No one supported me, he said. He had no witnesses, no lawyer. No one from the Roman church came to stand at his side. All deserted me, he said. 
We can assume that Luke, Titus, Tychicus, and others of his inner circle were absent for good reasons. They were likely away on missions and they'd not yet arrived back in Rome. But even so, it is surprising, is it not, that no one in the church at Rome would have come forward to assist Paul, at least to give him moral support by their presence. But they didn't. Now, the reason may be found in Nero's fiery persecution of the church. It had occurred, and many Christians had been brutally killed. So survivors may have been afraid of the authorities. They they weren't ready to put their lives on the line for Paul. They weren't the friend and brother of Proverbs 17, 17, who loves at all times and is born for adversity. They all deserted him. The word deserted here is the same word that's used in verse 10 of Demas. He abandoned Paul because he loved this present world. But in both cases, the motivation is really the same, whether it's, it's due to fear of affliction, fear of persecution, or a desire for comfort. Desertion occurred because of self-interest, which is a strong impulse in, in all of us. Still, it's remarkable that the Apostle Paul, who was so selfless, who had traveled over land and sea to save souls, agonized over the churches and and suffered for the saints more than any apostle would be deserted at that hour. But it happened. And yet Paul was not bitter. In fact, just the opposite. His concern was for those who deserted him. Notice what he says, may may it not be counted against them. Paul understood man's condition. He understood it quite well. He knew what the psalmist said the Lord knows in Psalm 103, and that is that we are weak. We're just dust. And so the Lord is considerate of that. He's very gentle with us. He's very patient with us. He's always taking account of our condition, our fragility, and he deals with us according to it. And Paul did that as well. He represented the Lord's character here. He displayed the Lord's nature here. He was patient and gracious gracious toward his fellow saints. It's not easy to do. Not when they've disappointed you. And that was Paul. That's what he did. And though he was alone, he really was not alone. The the failure of his friends actually became an occasion for experiencing the faithfulness of Christ. Men deserted him to their shame, but he writes in verse 17, the Lord stood with me. In fact, he might have said, the saints weren't with me, but best of all, the Savior was. He is the fulfillment of all those statements in the Proverbs. He is the brother born for adversity, the the friend who loves at all times and sticks closer than a brother. Paul had experienced that before. This wasn't the only occasion where Paul experienced the faithfulness of the Lord. His whole life and ministry was punctuated by that when he was in Corinth, rejected by the synagogue, discouraged by what had occurred. Christ came to him in a vision at night and he said, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you. Acts 18 verses 9 and 10. In Acts 23, Christ appeared to him in jail in Jerusalem stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. And these really, these statements of encouragement that are given to him there in the book of Acts are really just the promises that God had given throughout the Old Testament. Those promises, for example, in Isaiah 41 verse 10 and Isaiah 43 verses 2 and 3, were fulfilled for Paul 
in a very difficult time. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When you pass through the rivers, I will be with you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, for I am the Lord your God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experienced that very literally when they were thrown, bound, tied up into the fiery furnace, and the Son of God was there with them. You remember Nebuchadnezzar comes off his throne when he sees there's a fourth one in there, one like the Son of God. And there he was with those three men in the flames. That's an amazing picture presented to us. Those men having fellowship with the Lord in the fire. He's with us then. Daniel experienced it when Christ was with him in the lion's den and shut the lion's mouths. The Lord is always with his people. He is everywhere because the Lord is omnipresent, just as he is omniscient and omnipotent. His human nature is present in heaven on the throne at God's right hand where he is in his priestly ministry for us, interceding for us, sympathizing with us. He's there. But in his divine nature, which is unlimited, he's everywhere. He fills the world and dwells in every believer in a special way. Dwells in us in a way different from the way he is in everything else. In John 14, verse 23, the Lord spoke of that. The Lord promised those who love and obey him that he and the Father will make their abode with him or with her. They will dwell in us through the Holy Spirit, and they do. So we're never alone. The Lord's always with us, and he was with Paul at that very difficult time when he made his defense before the judges. It was a test of the apostles' faith and a test of his courage. One of the older commentators, Alfred Plummer, envisioned the scene of the trial as possibly occurring in the Roman Forum with Nero as the presiding judge. It would have been a court where the public had access and one that was cosmopolitan since Rome was the capital of the empire and representative city of the Gentile world. It would have been, you can imagine, an intimidating situation to have been in, but not one that Paul had not faced before. He went before the Jewish Sanhedrin, stood before them more than once. He stood before King Agrippa and the Roman governor Festus. And before that, he'd stood before the Roman governor Felix. But this was the the greatest of the Gentile courts. And Paul's life on, on this occasion was on the line. It was also the greatest audience he'd stood before. And, and Paul was ready. His previous experiences had made him ready. When Churchill entered number 10 Downing Street for the first time as prime minister at the start of the Second World War, he said, all my previous experiences have prepared me for this hour. It was the same with the Apostle Paul. God had been preparing him all along, all along the way, all through his life and ministry and difficulties and challenges, all the way for that hour. So when he made his defense before Nero and the Roman court and that august Gentile audience, he knew what to do. He'd done, he did then what he had done before on those other occasions. He stood firm, he proclaimed the truth. And he did not fail. He did not fail because, as he said, Christ stood with him. And he says, he strengthened me. Not only does he stand with us, he strengthens us. The grammarian, A.T. Robertson, translated that, poured power into me. The Lord doesn't lead us where he hasn't prepared us to go. And when we go, he goes with us. 
and always provides, always pours power into us. That was his promise to his disciples. In Mark chapter 13, verse 11, he told them of the future difficulties they were going to have, of the future court appearances that they would have, that they'd be dragged into. And he told them not to worry, not to worry about what they would say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is a supernatural thing. The Spirit of God dwells in you, the third person of the Trinity, He's with you, He will speak through you. Now that's, that's a great thing. That is a, a, an amazing assurance that He gave to them and He gives to us, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to be good students of the Scriptures and prepare ourselves. The Lord wasn't counseling them to do that. He wasn't saying, don't worry about things, don't study. Obviously, He wouldn't be suggesting that. We do need to do those things. We do need to study. We always, as God's people, need to be reading and studying and learning and advancing in the truth. We need it. We naturally should desire it, have an overwhelming appetite for it. Certainly we're to do that. God does not use unprepared people. Now, He can. And perhaps he does, and I'm sure he has. But generally speaking, God does not use people who are unprepared, people who don't care enough about his word to read it and study it. But those who do and who walk by faith will be blessed in the critical moment. Paul was. The Holy Spirit directed his thoughts and speech so that he says... Through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. Paul proclaimed the gospel in the capital of the Gentile world before the ruler of the Gentiles and he considered that the climactic act of his ministry. That moment he fulfilled it. 30 years earlier when he sat blind and alone in a house on Straight Street in Damascus, the Lord said of him, He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. He fulfilled that calling in Rome and finished faithfully when he bore the name of Christ before Nero. Didn't remain silent, but spoke the gospel. He seized the opportunity because Christ was with him. And because he was, Paul said he was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The lion's mouth. Now that is an intriguing phrase. We can't help but wonder what does it mean? Is it to be taken literally? That's possible. I mean, Read that and we naturally think of the amphitheater and all those Christians that were thrown to the lions, given to the wild beasts. But while that's possible, it's probably not likely since Paul was a Roman citizen. He would have been spared that, though with Nero, who knows? Or it might refer to Nero. Josephus wrote that the death of Tiberius Caesar was announced with the words, the lion is dead. And they didn't mean the great one was dead, but the tyrant was dead. And Nero would certainly have fit that description. He was a, a beast of a person. And then, of course, Peter refers to Satan as a roaring lion. So maybe Paul is saying the Lord rescued him from Satan's devices. And Paul himself writes about the wiles of the devil and all the different tricks that he has and all of the dangers that he presents for us. All of that's possible too. All of these are possible. Or this may simply be a, a general way <clears throat> of speaking of danger. Whatever it was, Paul is presented as a New Testament Daniel for whom God shut the lion's mouth. Even so, Paul 
knew the rescue was only a temporary reprieve. It was a reprieve. But he knew he would die. He knew that he was going to a martyr's death. In fact, he speaks of that in this book. But the Lord had delivered him from fear so that he preached, he fulfilled his ministry, and he rescued Paul from immediate harm so that he could write this letter for us and then see Timothy again. And Paul was confident about the future as well. He knew that the Lord would rescue him from every evil deed, as he says in verse 18. He knew that whatever was coming in those last days, that the Lord would protect him. No spiritual attack or temptation could undermine his faith and turn him off the way of Christ. He knew that the Lord would keep him persevering in the faith. The Lord would keep him faithful to the end. And death itself... Death itself would be a rescue. It would deliver him from the very presence of evil. And that very difficult place where he was at that moment, physically, emotionally, spiritually, he would be rescued from that. And that God would bring him safely into his eternal kingdom. He would bring him safely into heaven. That's what Paul says. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Paul had that assurance. Every Christian has that assurance. The Bible is plain. Those whom God has chosen, called, regenerated, justified, can never be lost. And we were singing that. It was our last hymn. He will hold me fast. I don't hold myself fast. He holds me fast. He keeps us preserved. He preserves us in the faith. That's God's grace. It's not, it's not Paul's strength of character. It's not Paul's determination. It is all the work of God, and that's who he attributes it to here. It is God's grace. And by God's grace, he's saying, I'll persevere to the end. And by God's grace, we will do that. We will stay faithful to the end. Oh, Christians, of course, sin. Christians, of course, fail. We are overcome by evil. And Christians do need to guard against indolence and spiritual lethargy. We're often warned of these kinds of things. And the the epistles are filled with these kinds of warnings to be on guard. But the assurance the Christian has is that in spite of our failures and in spite of our falls, God does not allow the spiritual life implanted at regeneration to completely die. Now the spark of life goes dim, that's true, but it never goes out. That's Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. What he began in you, he was telling those Philippians, and what he's telling us by, by application is, the God who began the work in you, and he began it, you didn't begin it yourself, he will complete it, always. We can trust him. He'll hold us fast. Now that work and its blessing of salvation, which was fixed in eternity past, was not left, is not left, contingent, that is, dependent on the uncertainty of man's uh, faithlessness. And one thing that is certain about us is our faithlessness. Paul wrote about that earlier in chapter 2 and verse 13. If we are faithless, and we are faithless. If we're faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. He cannot break His promise toward us, His covenant with us, to always remain faithful. But also, the believer's security follows from Christ's work of atonement. It's complete. Remember, He said, it is finished, and it is. He paid for all of our sins on the cross. It is impossible for his work to fail and for for one who is justified to ever again fall under the condemnation of sin because he's paid for all of it. What, What would we be condemned for? 
Whatever it is, it's been paid in full. Past, present, future. We can't be called again under the condemnation of those sins. Satan is there to attack us at the throne of grace, at the throne of God. He's there day and night accusing the saints. But his accusations, while with some validity, cannot sting because God has taken it all in his son through his sacrifice. And it's impossible for God not to achieve his purpose. God's purposes cannot fail. He is God Almighty. He cannot fail, and it's impossible for Christ's prayers on our behalf to fail and go unanswered. We have a great example of his prayer, prayer for us, one of his petitions in John 17, verse 24, where he prayed, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me. Christ's desire is that we, that, that his people, those whom God gave to him, his elect, and those for whom he died, be with him forever. Can that possibly fail to happen? That's a rhetorical question. Of course not. It's been said that we are Christ's jewels, his crown. And that heaven would not be heaven to him if we were not there. I believe that. Those whom he purchased for himself at Calvary will be with him forever, just as he prayed to the Father. And he ensures that that, that is so by never leaving us. He is always with us. He proved that to Paul on many occasions, he stood with him in Rome and strengthened him when he made his final defense. Jesus promised his disciples in John 14, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. He will not leave any of us as orphans. He's always with us. When you're sick, he's at your bedside. When you are grieved and afflicted, he is touched with the feelings of our disappointment and is there when we are alone, left by others. He's beside us. He is one to whom we can tell all of our sorrows and doubts and anxieties and disappointments, and he listens as a friend. Robert Murray McShane called Jesus the sinner's friend. Shane was a remarkable man. He died at the age of 29, but during his brief life, he had a profound ministry in Scotland. He seemed to begin his spiritual life fully grown and fully armed. What led to his, his spiritual birth was the death of his older brother, David, who was a godly young man, good to his younger brothers, uh, a model for them. He died at the age of 26. It deeply affected McShane. He later wrote to a friend, This day, 11 years ago, I lost my loved and loving brother and began to seek a brother who cannot die. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. Friends may leave us and brothers may die, but Christ is a brother who cannot die. He cannot ever be taken from us. He can, he can never abandon us. He is always with us. And because his great desire is that we be with him and see his glory, he will bring us safely into his heavenly kingdom. That's what Paul says. That conviction didn't lead him into license or laziness. Well, I'm saved. That means I can do whatever I want. Eternal security does not mean that at all. In fact, it gave him joy and in the security that he had that, it, that led to and issued in a doxology at the end of verse 18. To him be glory 
forever and ever. Amen. And that meant Paul wanted to live for his glory, not to his own self-satisfaction. To live a selfless life that Christ would receive the glory. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's how Paul ended Romans 11. With a statement, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Since God is the source of everything, everything that is or ever will be, since all things are from Him, since He sustains everything that is or ever will be, since it is all through Him, and since He is the goal of everything, it is all to Him, it follows that He gets all the glory. You are God's creation. He designed you and made you. He, he wove you together in your mother's womb, as David put it in Psalm 51. He keeps you alive at every moment. He sustains the air you breathe and the ground you walk on at every moment. He keeps the entire universe in existence by the power of His will. The earth, the moon, the stars, the novas and galaxies of deep space. And he does it all out of his own good pleasure. For his own glory. And he wants his brothers and sisters to see that glory. And to be a part of it. And men don't like to hear those statements that I just made. They don't want to hear that they are creatures. Because if they're creatures, there's a creator. They don't want to hear that they're all dependent upon Him for everything and made for Him, for His glory. That they are not independent, but that they, they're not self-sufficient, that they, they're not self-made and made only for themselves. They don't want to hear that. But we who know Him, who have received his saving grace, we know that, and we want to hear that. We should know that, and we should want to hear that. We need to remind ourselves of that all the time. This is the God who is. He, he, he controls everything. It all comes from Him. And we should rejoice in that and gladly say with Paul to Him, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And remember, those words were written by a man in a dungeon facing an undeserved death. Yet he could face it with confidence and praise God even in the cold and the dark, in the worst of circumstances. He could rejoice and give glory to God. Why? Because he knew Him. He knew Christ was always with him and always faithful. And if he was there by God's will, there was a purpose in it, even if he couldn't see it clearly himself. He could rest and trust in Him. His Lord is faithful. He knew that He is a brother born for adversity and will not allow anything to keep Him from His heavenly kingdom. That's the Lord. We need to know Him like that. We need to know that Lord. We need to make that our ambition, as it was Paul's ambition, to know Him. That was his great ambition, that I might know him. And Paul did. He knew him and the fellowship of his resurrection, and the, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He knew about him and he knew him personally and grew in that. And as our relationship with him develops, and we increasingly know him as our elder brother who is always watching over us, then Paul's words will naturally be ours. They'll spring from us as naturally as they did with Him. Finally, following the doxology, Paul sends greetings and wishes to friends he would not see again, not in this life, in words that would be his last words, the last words that he wrote. First, he sends greetings to Prisca and Aquila, old friends with whom he had ministered in Corinth and in Ephesus. In fact, in Romans 16, he wrote that they had risked their own necks for him. 
They were brave and faithful, and they were still ministering in Ephesus, completely devoted to the Lord. They'd not turned away from, from Paul. They were among his loyal friends. What an encouragement that was to Paul to, to come to the end of his life when so many had drifted away, so many had been frightened into not supporting him, and to know that there were still old saints ministering faithfully to the end. They were great encouragement to him. And others were as well. He greets the household of Onesiphorus. Back in chapter 1, verse 16, he wrote how Onesiphorus came to Rome and eagerly searched for Paul until he found him. That would have been a difficult task in and of itself and a dangerous one as we considered uh, those weeks before. But he found him and he, he said he often refreshed him. And so Paul prays blessing upon that household. Paul gives some personal knowledge to Timothy about Erastus and Trophimus. And then verse 21 tells Timothy to make every effort to come before winter. That was urgent, not only because the cold months would cause discomfort for Paul, who was, you remember, without his cloak, and he's asked Timothy to bring it, but that's not Paul's only concern, maybe not even his main concern here with the onset of winter, but the fact that when it comes, the Adriatic Sea would be closed to shipping for some weeks. And so if Timothy did not hurry, he would be cut off from Rome and he would, re, uh, he would arrive too late to be with the apostle. And, and Paul very much wanted Timothy and Mark with him in his last days. I think that in itself is kind of a touching fact, uh, uh, a very human touch to the Apostle Paul. We don't think of Paul as being a man who needs fellowship necessarily. We think of him as this strong lion of God. And yet here's Paul in need of Christian companions. He's wanting that desperately. And certainly he would because that's the way we're made. We're made to be in fellowship with others, with one another, and we desperately need that. We don't stand alone. And so he wanted to see them as his spiritual children, and they, of course, wanted to see their spiritual father and friend before he died. And so he urged Timothy to hurry. He gives greetings from a few of the Roman Christians and then ends with a prayer that is in two parts. The first part is for Timothy in particular. The Lord be with your spirit. He could say that with great confidence because the Lord had always been with him and he knew that he'd always be with Timothy. And that's the best of all. The Lord is with us. Now that prayer is written in the singular. Singular you or your singular spirit. The second half, though, grace be with you, is written with a plural you. And it indicates that this was written not just for Timothy, but for the church at large. So the letter that was written to Timothy, a very personal letter in many ways, was to be read to the church. These are the last words written by Paul that have survived. And not surprisingly, they are a prayer for grace. Grace be with you. Grace be with all of you, he's saying. That was Paul's great theme. And it is what the church survives on. The story of every Christian is one of God's unmerited favor. That is how we began. That is how we will end. And it means that we will end well because of that. That every believer in Jesus Christ will meet again in that heavenly kingdom. In the words of Newton's great hymn, and grace will lead me home. It did Paul. According to tradition, he was beheaded outside Rome on the Ostian Way. That must have been a very sad day for Timothy and Mark and Luke. But the ministry didn't stop and the church didn't end with Paul's death. John Wesley, whose dying words were, best of all, God is with us, also used to say, God buries his workmen, but his work goes on. 
He buries his workmen triumphantly and his work goes on victoriously and it will to the very end because of the very thing Paul prayed for, God's grace. Have you experienced that grace? It's only found in Jesus Christ who died for sinners and was raised from the dead for their justification and is seated at the right hand where he prays for us day and night. If you've not believed, then you're still guilty. You're still in your sins. And you must someday stand before a judge much more terrifying than the one Paul stood before in Rome. You stand before Jesus Christ, who is, as Paul said earlier in chapter 4, the righteous judge. We don't want God's righteousness in that condition, His justice. But for all who believe in Him, He's not the righteous judge, He's the Savior who has delivered us from that judgment and from the wrath to come, delivered us from the lake of fire and gives eternal life. So believe in Him. That's all that's required. Faith is, as has been illustrated by others, the empty hand that receives the gift of God. Open your hand. Receive the gift of life in Christ. When you do, you gain a brother born for adversity who is always with you, an elder brother who cannot die. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to rest in that confidently and serve the Lord faithfully. Let's end with hymn number 47 in the songs of praise. Oh, the love of my Redeemer. And then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 47. What a great thing to sing about, Father, and sing praise about the love of our Redeemer never fails. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. We thank you that you'll never let us go. You'll always hold on to us. You'll bring us safely into your heavenly kingdom, and we can say confidently now in this life, best of all, Christ is with us. Thank you. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.